Good afternoon and welcome to the last session of what has been an amazing streaming media East Connect. I think I can say confidently this has been our best virtual conference yet. It's certainly been our biggest and it won't be our last. We're going to be doing one more streaming media connect in August and we'll have more information about that coming out soon. But we're already planning our return to in-person events with Streaming Media West in Huntington Beach in November. Steve Nathans Kelly just popped the link to that website in the chat. Check it out. If you're interested in speaking at that event, please go to the call for speakers at the website. If you're interested in sponsoring, all the information you need to know is there as well. A couple of housekeeping notes. This and all of the streaming media uh, East Connect sessions will be available within about 24 hours after uh, we're done. And you can find them at our YouTube channel, which Steve also just posted in the chat. And we are going to keep that chat open during this panel, but we do request that you put any questions you have for our panelists in the Q&A panel uh, at the bottom of your screen. That will make it a little easier for Alan, our moderator, to keep track of them if they're all in one place. Before we jump ahead in our discussion, I would like to give one last thanks to Signiant, who has been our diamond sponsor for Streaming Media East Connect. And we've got a short video message from Signiant. When the director calls action. And action. When the game is on. It's or it's time to save the universe again. Media Shuttle is there. Trusted by more than 25,000 media companies, Media Shuttle delivers, making it easy and secure to send any size file anywhere fast. The journey begins with Media Shuttle portals, customized and branded for any project and designed to be so easy, your end users will love it. All while giving operations teams complete control through a simple yet powerful admin interface. Add users, set permissions, customize file delivery specs, and report on all activity. Blast off with proprietary acceleration technology. Media Shuttle moves your content anywhere in the internet connected world at hyper speeds. Along the way, your files are protected. Our commitment to enterprise grade security has made Media Shuttle a preferred tool with Hollywood studios, major sports leagues, broadcasters, and more. With Media Shuttle, your files are never handed over to Signiant. File movement is orchestrated between the end user's workstation and your storage, whether on-prem or in the cloud. Your IT team simply provisions your storage, connecting it to the Media Shuttle cloud service, and Signiant handles the rest. Get started on your Media Shuttle journey today, a journey without limits. And I would also like to thank the sponsor of this panel, Kaltura, for helping make this panel possible. And uh, without much further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Alan McLennan, who is going to moderate this discussion, where the question before us is, are we about to see or are we already seeing a great rebundling? So, Alan, take it away. Thanks, Eric. You know, one of the things I guess we're going to have to get down to is the definition of rebundling. You know, what is it, you know, and how are we going to approach it? And, you know, we've all had a love-hate relationship with the cable companies over the years. I mean, who hasn't? Wherever you are in the world, you know, you pay money to get the entertainment you expect to have. But during the course of all that, you know, part of the pricing model that was so um, readily available were access to hundreds of channels that you may or may not want. Um, but you want one or two or three of them. And that's where we've come within the industry in and of itself is we've gotten to a point where we're able to select what we'd like to watch when we watch it and what on and whatever, wherever we want to watch it at, at this time. So when it comes down to rebundling, what is it? What is rebundling? Um, is it channels? Is it aggregated channels? Are there super aggregators? Or is it content in and of itself? Today, we're gonna to have a really good opportunity because we have three experts in this area. We have John Gigengak from Hub Entertainment Research. Um, we have Rone Swartz from Kaltura, and we have Anthony Laser from Zumo Comcast. Um, what I'm gonna ask each one of our panelists along with myself, um, I'm Alan McLennan. Um, I have been up until recently, the chief executive of, of Padam Media Group. 
and um, and on to bigger um, opportunities that I have and will be making the announcement in the next month or so. Uh, but in the meantime, what we're going to be exploring are these topics with John Gingyak. Can you take us through a little bit about your background, please, John? Uh, sure. I started a company in 2013 called Hub Entertainment Research, and we're a consumer research company that uh, fields about 10 studies a year uh, to learn everything we can about how people find, choose, and consume uh, entertainment content in in a, a world where everybody has a, a broadband pipe in their house and a, and a computer in their pocket. Well, that's interesting. Renee, would you take us through what you're, what, how are you, you're in New York City, so tell us a little bit about what's going on there and about yourself. Hi, yeah, uh, hi from New York City. New York City is coming back, as I said, the tourists are coming back and, uh, and the, the good weather is helping. Uh, but personally here, I represent Cultura and, uh, and our offices are coming back and well as well, but nothing really stopped for us. As you know, this was a big year for streaming video. So, uh, you know, for better or worse, uh, uh, you know, uh, business uh, kept us busy. And so excited to talk about some of the things we're seeing in the industry this past year and beyond. <laughs> Keeping you busy. That's an understatement. We'll get to it. Anthony, you've moved over from Zumo, but you're with them within Comcast. How's that going? And please give us a little bit of background on yourself. Hey, thanks, Alan. Yeah, it's it's going really well. Um, right around the time that the pandemic started, we actually were acquired by Comcast. So we have been integrating while remote uh, with with our new parent. Um, but I think, you know, uh, the the acquisition of Zumo by Comcast is especially germane to this panel that we're having today. Um, and, uh, you know, for me personally, I, I began with Zumo uh, in 2017. I came on to uh, for both uh, business development with content partnerships and with programming strategy. And programming strategy in the fast space is so dramatically different now than uh, what it was in 2017. Uh, 2019 was a really big year for the space where things started moving very fast. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to having this conversation and kind of talking about this evolution that's occurred. I mean, just in the last, you know, in the last year, fast has got such incredible traction. I mean, even with Fubi announcing a billion, you know, um, dollars in revenue with, with Fox. So that that in and of itself, and what you have experienced and what is being said to you within the market is something of great interest in this discussion. John, can you so you just published a really great report? Could you take us through that report to set the stage and sure. have us be able to um, uh, work off of that as well as open our discussion up? Sure. So. Uh... Every year since 2013, um, each April, we publish a study called the Best Bundle, and, and it happens to be on the exact topic that uh, this panel is on. In a, in a world where all these standalone options exist, how, uh, what are the bundles that people are creating on their own, and, uh, and how do they choose what providers they're including in those bundles? And just a few high-level findings. One thing that we've seen each year, and the pandemic really uh, accelerated this, is that the average person is getting content from more sources than they've ever gotten content from before. So in the survey, they tell us all the different sources that they're using. And then we calculate an average uh, that includes all of those categories written in the footnote at the bottom. And as you can see, uh, in 2021, we got all the way up to 5.7. So that includes cable, it includes uh, streaming subscriptions, it includes AVODs and fast platforms. It includes transactional buying individual titles, but really the the number of sources has never been has never been higher. And uh, as we can see, the number of people who say they have a traditional pay TV subscription has dropped, but the number who say they stream from at least one platform is really about the same. So what's driving that big increase? And the answer, and it's a really important answer, is that there's greater density. So in 2021. 59% uh, of all the respondents in this study said they used at least two of the five biggest streaming platforms. That was up from 51% uh, last year. But when you think about it, you know, the 40% of people were using three or more of them this year, up from 28% last year. Uh, 
And every one of those platforms has essentially, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of titles to watch. People are using more of them. The only thing that isn't expanding is, uh, is the amount of time in the day to watch television. That's, you know, there's only 24 hours available to do anything during the day. And uh, people are having to shoehorn a lot more content, exclusive content, really good content in, into the same amount of time. And we see that even among uh, those people who are planning to add new providers, you know, have they hit a threshold where they, where they aren't going to add any more? People who say they plan to you know, add new services in the future, three quarters of them say they're going to keep the providers they have, and these new providers will be in addition. Now, uh, people aren't always the best, most reliable barometers of what they're actually going to do in the future, but at least attitudinally, we know they, there are many who don't feel like they've hit a threshold yet. So that number could even grow a bit more. And it's even higher among people who already have more platforms. They're actually more likely to add more platforms to their total than those who have fewer. And finally, when we look at people who are using more platforms, uh, while those people tend to be paying a lot more money, they're also more likely to say, that they feel like their TV needs are being very well met. So more platforms usually means uh, someone who feels like they're getting a better TV experience. So, you know, it seems clear to us that uh, people are really excited about all the options they have, all the new content to choose from, and that it's really important for TV providers to, uh, to enable them to really easily use a large number of sources, make it easy to navigate them, to find what they wanna watch next, and to get something on the screen with the smallest number of clicks. Hmm. Hmm. You know, it, it's like you're raising some really interesting points within that uh, report. And um, if anyone has any interest in that report, I'm sure, John, that there's ways of getting in touch with you to be able to have access to that. Um, the you, you, you said some things in there that, that really kind of resonate with me. You're using platforms almost in place of channels, um, mm -hmm. as, as, as that's the term, you know, not sources, not sources, but um, platforms, you know, and, and, and as we opened up this discussion, we, we started to look at how, you know, kind of in the old days, you know, bundling was networks, you know, how many networks can you get in, just quantity, tons of stuff, fire hose that's being fed down to you at any particular time. That was what was selective and that was what was available at the time that you wanted to watch. Now that we're in a point where we're selecting our interests and we're wanting to watch the content that is that we will choose, no longer is it firehose, it's selective. And so you're saying that the new term for what used to be called broadcast channels is now platform. Um, and, and the end of that is also stacking. Um, the viewers are in and of themselves, 77% were saying that they're going to keep what they have. Yeah, we're going to see how that goes. Uh, because as you start getting into keeping what you have and adding on top of it, your monthly viewing budget becomes pretty costly. You know, and that's where the new rebundling comes into play. And Anthony, I want to go to you with FAST. You know, you mentioned FAST, free advertising supported television. Are you seeing that kind of platform change versus channels change? I mean, I'm, I'm working with those two statements right now. We're past channels, we've moved to platforms. Fast, is that the accelerant, no pun intended, in where we're going with this kind of marketplace? Is that the new direction? Yeah, I mean, but it also is sort of grounded in a very traditional sort of layout when you start with a lot of these fast platforms, you're talking about, you know, EPG interfaces driving you into a linear on now, what we call on now channel experience. Uh, John mentioned at the very end of what he was saying, a very important piece, which is as little navigation as possible. So a sort of in a fast platform, uh, you have an economy of navigation. So you're immediately uh, into a live TV experience. That's a critical piece of that. There's no paywall or it's really getting you into a viewing experience as fast as possible. Um, and so it's similar to traditional MVPD TV in that way. But I think, you know, one of the big differences, if, if you know, at least as far as I see, 
is um, uh, MVPDs used to be like a utility so that all the channel lineups were fairly uh, similar. You would have, you know, negotiations and for one reason or another, certain services wouldn't have a channel for a period of time. But for the most part, uh, channel lineups were there, there were the, the, the ESPNs, the A&E, the discovery channels were consistent. Uh, that's very different now in the fast space where uh, platforms want to differentiate uh, their channel lineups. They want to have exclusive program programs and, and find unique uh, niche audiences and may have different channels for that. So I think that's where I draw the biggest distinction as when you're talking about bundling and, and MVPDs versus fast, fast platforms um, is that uh, is that uh, how these channel lineups are still sort of in a nascent stage and sort of uh, crystallizing. Uh, 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 you know, there are certainly channels that are consistent across uh, all these different fast platforms, but there are certainly huge deviations from one fast platform to the next. You know, before I get to you, Ronit, uh, I just want to comment a little bit about, you made a really good point, and that is, for the new viewer that, um, you know, as little of navigation as possible, you know, saving the economy, the economy of time to be able to get to the programming that they want to be able to watch. And, and that to me seems to be what it used to be. That used to, you know, so in some ways we've taken two steps forward, but we've taken one step back in television and broadcast modeling, you know, and how, how we're engaging with content. For the casual viewer that just wants to come and gel out and watch something, we're back to, you know, we're fast. That's that's providing content, it's advertising supported, and it's available to them whenever they want. If they want to have a little bit more rich content, a little bit better viewing experience, then they will move to the subscription uh, model in and of itself for that kind of content and programming. You know, first run, new, top tier types of programming. Um, Rooney, you know, when you're looking with Calterra, you know, you're dealing with this daily on the migration of how uh, broadcasters are, are competing and combating the evolution of what we were just talking with Anthony about with the FAST model. Yeah, I actually don't think it's a two steps forward, one step back. It's actually bringing the best of both worlds in my mind, right? We've all oh. come full circle. So we're keeping all the benefits of the streaming Right, but we are going back to the lean back experience of mm -hmm. your, you know, MVPD experience, right? So if we, when we first, you know, the emergence of streaming was a very VOD uh, focused experience where people selected and, and binged specific content, right? And there were many clicks maybe on your menu page, on your homepage to get to your show. And people actually did perhaps miss that lean back experience of just turning on an easy discovery, right, of now on content in the linear channel experience. So we're actually merging that now in fast the two together, right? We're keeping everything that we, people like about streaming and the user experience and the technology, but enabling easier lean back discovery of content. So I do think it's, you know, and that I think is what's contributing amongst others to, to you know, the adoption of fast channels. Um, I think one of the things we're seeing at Cultura when, you know, when we talk to our um, cable operators, I do believe that the direct-to-consumer streaming service didn't necessarily compete directly with the cable operators, but fast being so close in nature and having, being, you know, an aggregator sometimes of multiple programmers is more closely aligned with maybe what that traditional MVPD is offering. And of course the, the virtual MVPDs are direct competition, right, to your traditional. So, so that's really, they were never really competing with Netflix in a sense, but they may be somewhat competing with the fast and the virtual MVPDs of the world. So there is a, um, you know, some challenge there to, to, to you know, maintain that relationship with, with the user. Okay, so, so now we've like tipped into the cable operators um, as we, as this panel was really focused on, <clears throat> Where do you think the cable club operators are going to be going? I mean, how, how are they going to be approaching? Like what opportunities because of this are going to be available to the cable operators and providers? Where do you think they're going to go? Do you think they're going to support that? Are you going to create their own, what used to be called, you know, or do some dating terminologies here, but, you know, gosh, you know, how many years ago walled gardens? Now it's a super aggregator, mm -hmm. you know, and how things are, 
pulled together. Is this an area that is going to be beneficial for cable operators and providers to play? Yeah, I think super aggregator is definitely the direction, right? If you can't beat them, join them, right? So we have to remember that the cable operators, even though we're all, you know, probably quote, you know, cord cutters on this session, cable is still in over 80 million households in the United States, right? So it's definitely, they still have access to many traditional uh, U.S. households. And I think they have a great opportunity in aggregating and bringing in some of the um, streaming providers, some of the pure OTT, the direct to consumers, like, you know, the Netflix and Disney Plus into their experience and aggregating that into a single experience, you know, and, and many of them, many of our clients are doing exactly that. Yeah, you know, um, John, are, are, you, are you seeing that as well in your research with the, the cable Absolutely. providers? Is that starting to shift over and become we, more real? Because before, let's face it, you know, 12, 14 months ago, you know, there, there was a lot of deer caught in the headlights type of like, what are we going to do here? Uh, have you seen a shift, a change? Yeah, so in a couple of our surveys, we talked to people who have both a paid TV operator and they've integrated one of the big SVODs with their video on demand menu. And, uh, and so people who have, you know, X1 and Comcast, just for instance, uh, if they have integrated their Netflix account at all, people who have done that once, two thirds of them say that that is then the way that they uh, tend to watch Netflix thereafter and they stop doing, you know, whatever, using whatever device they were using before. And people who, uh, the integrating SVODs with your cable subscription correlates with people that are less likely to churn and they're more likely to be satisfied with whatever cable provider that they're using. Mm -hmm. So that, that really is what I think is a, uh, you know, cable has been kind of the underdog to Netflix, at least the last few years, you know, he's a lot of the, a lot of the tailwinds have been behind Netflix. The, the underdog, the, the underdog to Netflix. I think that's, that's a really great statement right there. Yeah. Well, at least, at least in the, in the media and the conventional wisdom, but as people, you know, as that number of platforms that people are using continues to mount, um, as excited as they are about all their choices and about all that content, it really becomes unwieldy to use. And they really need someone to help them uh, aggregate that all together in an in a efficient way. And Netflix does a lot of things really well. Netflix is not an aggregator. They can only show you uh, their own content or their licensed content. But companies like Roku or Amazon or the pay TV company can aggregate um, video and in some cases aggravate lots of other things too and that is a the more that people uh their consumption is fragmented the more important some efficient way to pull it all together comes to them yes it's very true and you know, anthony <clears throat> when, when you're pulling together your modeling and your strategy and moving things forward with zumo um you know, is the model now with fast? Are the are the numbers for reach and keep you know engaging the viewer as as strong as what it was in past times on broadcasts? I mean, let's let's face it. You know, yes, GRPs and then elements that were always common um, measurement um, numbers were there, but now because of being able to identify and engage each viewer specifically, even through a fast. Are the reach numbers really compelling? And are we going to start seeing that shift over into fast as well? I mean, like we said, Fubi's going to make a, you know, it's going to have a billion revenue this year with Fox. I mean, that that that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the the scale is becoming really interesting to a lot of major companies that previously the main revenue was coming from MVPDs. So you certainly see companies like a and E and uh, Discovery and um, the major uh, the major networks really starting to build out their their uh, channels for specifically fast platforms. So they all already have the the major networks already have a news product. So they all have you know ABC and CBS and. Uh, you know, news now by Fox, so that they're, they're starting to build out specifically some of those products. Then there are others that are taking, um, you know, uh, smaller MVPD channels and sort of tweaking them for the space. You'll see, like, a, it'll be called, uh, you know, uh, Fuse XL rather than Fuse, which was previously uh, MVPD, or you'll have. Um, Ion Plus, 
Uh, and then they're also starting to take some over the airs now and moving over the air into a fast. Uh, uh, and why is all this happening? It's be because this, the scale is there, the revenue is there uh, that makes those sorts of um, you know, channel variations specifically custom for this space worth it. You know, that's a big difference from four years ago, five years ago when I joined Zumo and you were taking sometimes a lot of YouTube product or short form product and trying to create that into a, a, a linear channel. Now mm -hmm. that's not really the case. There are certainly, uh, you know, uh, previously like YouTube style companies take like a Jukin that are an aberration that they were able to actually pivot into this space and have success with brands like Fail Army and People Are Awesome. But yeah. that's very rare. Uh, you know, what it what the way things are moving right now is really it's looking uh, fast platforms look a lot like traditional TV. It's really hard uh, to differentiate and it what really kind of drove that forward uh, was, you know, Viacom uh, uh, acquiring uh, Pluto a couple years ago and infusing that platform with a huge amount of Viacom uh, catalog. And then suddenly you have, you know, them popping up RuPaul's Drag Race channel and Teen Mom channel and, and, and you know, taking those Viacom TV uh, brands and then really, um, really leaning into those. Uh, I think, you know, like you said, Fox bought Tubi, Comcast bought Zumo. Uh, and so we're all um, kind of trying to differentiate our platforms, but also there are certainly channels that are consistent across all of those, uh, as well as the other big players in the space, which are, you know, Samsung TV Plus, uh, the Roku channel, um, I mean, Samsung TV Plus is a is a very very interesting uh, platform to look at, and and the way it's integrated into those devices, and it's the number one selling TV in the United States. Smart TV is Samsung, and so suddenly you have what used to just be a device is now the the home mm -hmm. for this integrated Samsung TV Plus uh, fast experience. That's a huge opportunity just based on the amount of TV sales that Samsung. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think to, that's a long answer to your question, which is, <laughs> sorry, sorry for that. Yeah, but, but it's, yes, the opportunity is there. And that's why the channels are, are starting to be created by these major media companies and, um, and why there's a proliferation of the platforms. Well, there, there's two different answers right there. And I want to get to Ronit about this because you're saying platforms and channels again we're coming back to this it's like the separation of what it really is samsung is a device uh, it does have the relationships uh, with other networks that can and um, aggregation environment to be able to serve that up with their audience it, it seems to me that we're back to the kind of square one of separating this up is it is it a technical platform that's providing this, or is it actually a broadcast network that is serving up the kinds of content and programming, no matter what the platform is? You know, let's let's take um, Sinclair. You know, what is it? 100 and diff 180 different markets that they have around the country. They have Stir, which is their IP delivery. You know, and Stir has been supported by advertising since the get go. You know, I mean, there's an entity in and of itself that's a, a, a broadcast network, a local broadcast network and providing content for their individual um, communities. Is, is that the direction we're going to start seeing too? Or are we going to start seeing that kind of change? You know, Ronit, are you seeing that kind of interest in Kaltura of building out those kinds of offerings? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, your attempt to separate it, I, I don't think you'll succeed. I think there's kind of a convergence Trying. of hardware. <laughs> yeah, there's a convergence here of hardware and software and service providers, right? So where, you know, Roku used to be maybe the, just the stick and then started offering the content and others maybe had the content, but not the stick. And, as you know, um, to, uh, to Anthony's point, you know, Samsung being a hardware device and suddenly offering the content. So, 
you know, I don't know that, we, you know, we're going to continue seeing that convergence. And it's in the same way that a traditional MVPD used to offer you a setup box and a modem and then would uh, feed you the, the content. So, um, you know, we don't really have that separation anymore. But I do see, yeah, we, we're seeing a lot of interest from people to try to understand how they can manage their content across all these platforms and devices, how they can manage their users and audience across all these devices, and how to navigate the different business models, right? Because we're talking a lot about fast, but there is still a lot of room for subscription-based businesses. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of hybrid. So people are still very much experimenting and it's very interesting to see, you know, the different models that are forming in the industry. So would that be rebundling <laughs> the topic well, of this conversation? I mean, what you just described is bringing it all back together. Yeah, I think there's a lot of value to rebundling because as you said, people uh, need the ease of discovering and, and accessing and logging into content, right? So in, uh, I think the bundle gives you the unified uh, login, the unified uh, search, the unified settings and billings and, and all these user experience uh, conveniences that the people are using while still wanting to maintain you know, control of their content. So I think if what maybe was missing in the traditional MVPD uh, model was curation, right? So you had like 300 channels, but they weren't necessarily the channels you wanted. And 90% of it you've never watched and you didn't want to pay for all of it and you couldn't find anything in it. So those are the things that we, you know, we've moved away from. So now we have the emergence of skinny bell noodles and I am piecemealing the content that I want and curating kind of my own you know, set of programming. As, as I think uh, uh, John mentioned, people need at least four streaming services to meet their TV viewing uh, demands, right? They're piecemealing, you know, all these streaming services on top of pay TV, and we're really building our own bundle at home, and I want to be able to access it with ease and convenience. And yes, Cultura will offer, you know, the, the, the content ingest of the metadata in order to have a unified search, kind of all of the technology that you need in the back end in order to support that. You know, John, uh, to, to, to the point that Ronita has been saying right here, um, does your numbers show that the viewers are looking to create their own bundling, their own bundle in this case? Yeah. And, and is this the new definition by each viewers case by case? They don't, yeah, they don't necessarily think of it as a bundle, but um... You know, like one really interesting thing in our in the same study I was just showing you, 60% uh, of everybody in that study uses a combination of pay TV and streaming. So they're not, there are there are more people using pay TV in tandem with streaming platforms than are doing anything else. So people are still using both. And I think the key is that uh, uh, what Lauren said a second ago that that with a cable bundle, the bundles are bundles that somebody else created. So in our in our research, uh, Nielsen has similar numbers. The average person uses 20% or less of the channels that they have access to through their cable bundle. So there's a tremendous amount of stuff that they never ever use. And the reason that people leave, it's not uh, if you if you drill down, it's not the cost of cable. It's it's how much of what they're paying goes towards stuff that they never even use at all. But there's still some things that are easier to get on cable than you can get elsewhere. So what they're doing is uh, creating their own bundles. And if you have Netflix and Hulu uh, and HBO Max, you probably pick those because of some particular show you know you're interested in. And they're creating their own bundles that they've come up with on their own and that they know have things that they're going to be interested in watching, as opposed to paying for a big bundle that uh, – originally was appealing because of the vast quantity of stuff that was in there, even if you didn't use it. We've kind of flipped around to where quantity is only helpful if it's a quantity of things that you're interested in watching and otherwise it can be kind of a detriment. Yeah, and, and, you know, and, then, and then there's a second, um, let me think of it right now. Um, then there's the examples of the only way you can get HBO Max is by being a subscriber to HBO on the cable operator, you know, and then you have the access to the content and streaming and, and um, the on-demand component on that. I'm sorry, Rene, what, what were you uh, I was just reminded of a time where I, I uh, you know, I, I did an analysis of the old cable subscription packages. And I remember diving into a Korean package, a Korean language package by one of the top MVPDs, which I will uh, remain unnamed, but they had a, a wide offering of channels in Korean and then they had the fishing channel, the local Minnesota fishing channel as part of the channels. And I said, is there a specific affinity 
of Koreans and fishing that I'm not aware of? Are Koreans very interested in fishing? And then it was told no, but but contractually they're obligated to deliver, you know, a certain number of channels. And the carriage deal with, you know, another channel expired. And so, you know, you put in the fishing channel, right? And it's a win-win. So I think that's kind of the apologies for the background noise. That's kind of the things where where um, that I think people were initially so displeased with, you know, with with the, the PTV operators, and now looking to have more control over what they're paying for, right? Even if they're not necessarily paying less between all these services and upping their broadband service, et cetera, et cetera, they're not maybe they're not even saving money, but they have a kind of a control and transparency into the content, and it's 100% content that they want to watch. You know, you're, you're actually identifying something I think is really key when it comes to rebundling, and that is niche programming. I mean, you just identified it. You identified two areas that would be, you know, highly, probably not that attractive to the cable companies, including in a bundle, because it was just sheer viewing. The eyeballs that would be watching that wouldn't be the numbers that would be their point of, you know, cutting what channel um, they include in a particular bundle. Do you think... This is where the rebundling comes into place, coming back to the individual selection process of um, niche programming and building that up to a point where it actually becomes justifiably attractive to uh, the platforms to be able to serve and offer to their viewers. John, did you see any of those numbers kind of creeping in there a little bit on that? Yeah, I think, you know, the interesting thing about the rebundling that happens is that there's obviously the there's kind of the name brand, the 800 pound gorillas, like, like a Netflix or HBO max or Disney plus. Um, but it also creates this big opportunity on the other end of the scale for kind of the hyper niche, hyper specific channels. Uh, you know, Amazon channels, I think there's, you know, more than 300 of those now. And, and a lot of them are the really big, you know, cable channels that you can add on, but they also have these incredibly specific, uh, there's a, you know, there's like a military documentary. There's, one that's yoga for kids. There's uh, there's really cool ones like uh, like Shutter from AMC that specializes in horror movies and not just horror movies, but a very specific kind of horror movie. And the cool thing about the uh, the super aggregation is that those companies wouldn't have the the resources to kind of go out to the whole market and find an audience on their own. But when they're tagged on to uh, and can be added to a larger subscription, they can easily be put in front of the people that are going to be most interested in it. And a lot of people won't care, but the people who really do care about those very specific niches care about them a lot and will and we'll use them. Well, you, 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 you cited something really important, and that is what is a super aggregator and who is bundling it to become the rebundle of what we're used to and what we want. And Disney Plus is certainly one of those. You know, others that are out there that we haven't really addressed because we keep naming the same ones. You know, let's face it, Prime does a really good job. You know, Apple TV, um, as well as with quality programming that they're producing. Um, you know, with, but when it comes down to those, it is the rebundling aspect of this qualify to Acorn and BritBox, whereas you want to watch one installment of a particular season from Acorn. And then if you want to watch the rest of the season, it's at 250 or 295, um, you know, a, a, the next installment. Is that also part of this rebundling that, you know, you, you get a little taste, you want something, but if you want to continue, you have to pay more for that kind of programming? Or am I going down the wrong path with that from your numbers, John? Or is, that, is that something that is not really coming into play, but it, it's on Apple um, and it's on um, Prime heavily. Uh, you mean you mean like paying for individual episodes or All right you can buy the season for a certain amount or yeah. you can pay for it and who's going to pay for the next one at 250 right i mean um but but they do sample it that's what's yeah. called and they are involved and they're bundling this to see how this kind of um model works for their viewers um there are, there are always are the... fast and going into this and i'll get back to fast in a second but this has come up now as the, as the number of platforms and the amount of content that's out there increases, the interest that people have in uh, transactional where they buy individual episodes or titles becomes, not that they're not interested, but it just becomes more and more sort of specialized on special occasions that they're going to do that. What people really like is buying, uh, is having access to the content that they're the most interested in, no matter how 
weird it is. So we've even the most specialized, most picky viewer today has more content that's right in their wheelhouse than they have time to watch. They just have to be able to find it. And the cool thing about streaming and about the internet is that it lets these shows uh, find that audience. So this has happened tons of times with individual shows. If you look at Netflix, like a show like Arrested Development that uh, couldn't find a big enough audience on live TV because it wasn't a huge audience. And for those people to be available to watch at the, at the exact time that the show was on was a non-starter. But as soon as Netflix got it and put it online and everybody that was interested could watch whenever they wanted to, it became a big success because th that way the audience that cares can find it whenever they want it and they'll, and they'll seek it out. So that's a, that's a huge opportunity for smaller providers, I think, and smaller, less well-known titles that, that never existed before in, in a world that, of only linear TV. Well, you, you raise a point when it comes to the types of content, the aggregation of it, that we're talking about everything being video. Um, yeah, you know, within Roku and Fire, you know, you're able to not just have selections of your video programming, but you also have access to your music, if you want, or other mm -hmm. types of programming. And, and is that part of the bundling process? Have we moved, you know, we talk about bundling and it's always been cable bundles and vast quantities. Is bundling now the rebundling? It's yeah. a, the model it's a, it's of, a big of advantage. combining it together like an entertainment resource. Absolutely. Look at what Apple is doing. Sorry, right? You're bundling okay. gaming and music and TV content, and it's all content, and it's all really competing for people's time and attention anyway. So it's really becoming kind of your, your entertainment hub, right? Rather than just your TV. Right. Sorry. Interactivity. Um, you've got different companies, you know, you've got different service operators. You know, like um, Zone TV up in uh, Canada and on Comcast, that's an interactive television platform that allows for education, games, you know, and, and the different types of programming. And Netflix, just coincidentally, just this last week, made the announcement that they were going after games, you know. Um, fitness. Fitness. Business. Was yeah. Fitness. yeah. Fitness. I was looking for service, yeah. platform, channel. No, it's, it's the game's channel. business. Sorry, I meant fitness with an F. The fitness segment was huge uh, during COVID, right? People exercising, to, and that became real content that people seeked on these uh, with these providers. Oh. Alan, I think uh, we lost you. We, we lost. We lost you there for a second. I don't heard it. Um, there was. Alan, I think you're frozen. Uh, Alan, you're uh, you're frozen. Um, there he is. There he is. Take it back. I, I muted myself for a second there just to see if we can get ourselves back. I'm you're sorry. Back. I must have said something sensational. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was with you. I you was completely speechless. with you. <laughs> You were speechless. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, it, uh, um, I'm sorry I missed that. So it's, it's tar hard to uh, to comment. I mean, on, on my side, it was you that was, Renit, you're 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 frozen. But okay, it's it's on me. You know, but but when it comes no, back no, to I, games oh, just, and networks, John, please pick, pick I, it up. I was just going to add one thing on to what Renit said that that. Uh, there's, there's a huge, you know, we, we even see companies like uh, like Hasbro or Marvel that are expanding their IP into adjacent kinds of entertainment content. So that's all uh, consumers increasingly look at those as kind of commodities, just things I can do with my time. And it's usually on the same screen and sometimes even through the same devices. So even though it's a, a weird way for those of us in the industry to think about it, it's very much in line with what consumers think. But there's the whole other side of aggregation. Like, you know, one of the reasons that more people haven't cut their cable is because that's also where they get their internet. And maybe it's also where they get their home phone. Uh, a lot of people get their home security. A lot of people will be getting their connected home and 5G services through their provider. So again, consumers are really interested in efficiency and they don't particularly care. Um, it's not only in the realm of entertainment that they care about that. It's all these other things that they're buying, which are also multiplying and becoming more numerous and anything that, that can be done to make that more efficient is something that they're gonna they're gonna go for. So, so in other words, we're gonna start. God forbid that we're gonna have an Amazon QVC coming up here pretty soon. Is is is, is this gonna be Amazon uh, twenty four hours 
uh, uh, selling products on an ongoing basis. Is that the kind of content channels that we're talking about here too? Well, I mean, you know, Amazon is is proof that people want to have aggregation, even if they don't call it that. And when everything comes into one bill every month and you're not having to make individual transactions, in our research, we find that the barrier for people to add those channels on is much smaller because it's not just their, you know, the, that incremental $4.99, if you add it to your video bill, is a pretty big jump. But if you add it to your video bill and your music and your peanut butter and your sneakers, it's a lot, it's a lot smaller and almost imperceptible. And it's only one thing they have to think about. And so, Rudy, that's a great, yeah, you were speaking about niche services. Amazon does very well for, for those. I discovered some content there. Sundance, for example, Sundance Now, I never would have stumbled across them, I think, in a linear experience, but I saw, you know, they were recommended to me by Amazon, a, a piece of content there, and I ended up buying a subscription for Sundance Now via Amazon Prime so I could manage, uh, I have a single management of all my, my streaming mm -hmm. services. Descriptions. So that's a great example of that unified search, recommendation engines, all those things that are baked into the service that, that Amazon offers that really drives discovery and, and, and access to new content, which, you know, to me, this is a great service uh, by them. Yeah. And, and from what I understand, Kaltura has that capability of as far as being able to have a back end, the measurement, the advertising to provide that for other types of programmers that want to be able to build that kind of service, albeit not commerce, but from a video and engagement and a consumption standpoint. Yeah, exactly. We, we you know, our cloud to be platform powers a lot of, uh, you know, the, those players in market, right? Not necessarily Amazon, but all the others that want the Amazon like experience, the Netflix like experience, and they power the aggregation. We also provide that for the cable operators. So a lot of our customers are your traditional MVPDs who now moved away from their Quam based set up box to something like an Android TV set top box because they have that operator tier there where they can integrate a Disney Plus and a Netflix into a single experience. And so we drive that on the back end. And you know, and and then you know, they they benefit from the user experience, they benefit from um, the reduced uh, uh, cost, operational cost, et cetera. So so all kind of the benefits of the streaming world, but under the traditional MVPD model. You know, but, but you raise a really interesting point because we've gone through this whole process about the broadcasters and the change and competitive with the MVPDs and the OTT. We've, we've gone down this path. Now we're starting to go into the potential of that rebundling to also um, offer commerce channels. And, have, and But yet, as soon as you move into, the, well, let's face it, QVC is a huge thing and we don't have that within this world. But Amazon has that potential, or others would have that potential of having a shopping network, you know, whatever. And it's niche, it's the hunter's network, the fishing network, whatever it might be. You need to have that back end because now we're talking about television. This isn't online. This isn't, you know, a, a, this is web, it's IP, but it's not in that kind of capacity. It's literally streaming content and being able to have that interactivity to be able to purchase. And that's an area that, you know, we really rarely ever even discuss, but it's certainly part of what societal's behavior has been when it's come to television and the hybrid of laying on top of that, the IP interactivity to be able to take care of that. Which brings me to back to Anthony a little bit in talking about those kinds of smaller services. Are, are you constantly looking for those kinds of services to include into Zumo, or do they approach you on an ongoing basis? How do you provide and include these niche uh, programmers within your service? So we uh, we work with uh, you know all the major OTT ad demand partners, and then usually those kinds of opportunities kind of come through them. I think we're really at like an early, early stage with the ad experience on fast, fast platforms and in the OTT space where it's not, um, it's not as easy to target a user, an end user on a TV device as it is on a cell phone. Uh, you know, if someone's watching on a cell phone, you can deliver a pretty, um, a pretty custom ad experience Anybody who uses Instagram can see how uh, custom that can be. Um, but it's different when you have a TV often set up by, the IP is set up by the head of household um, and, and 
and the device is purchased, you know, most of the time by head of household. But then you may have certain platforms where, you know, it's preschool kids usage is 90% of it. Yeah, it's, sure. Uh, it is a little tricky still at this point for um, targeting an ad experience in the, in the OTT space, but it will get there. Uh, obviously, the you know, as, as more and more ad demand moves into the space and, and it, and, you know, we're, there's already a lot of local uh, ge and geographic targeting that can be done. So local ads uh, are, are, are something that, you know, is, is beginning to, uh, to be a bigger part of the, uh, and addressable in general is becoming a bigger part. And so I think at a certain point, um, what you're talking about having overlays for actual commerce and um, being able to purchase. I've seen a lot of technology, not, none has progressed where it's like, if you see this shirt that some actor is wearing, that wow. you can then click on it and then go to a commerce experience and then resume the sh show. So there's always these like different sort of technologies that are trying to um, merge that into the experience. Um, so I, it's, you know, we're not there yet, but it's certainly something that is, is coming. Yeah, but I, I, I have that on a nightly basis on, on Xfinity. Um, that little bar goes down the bottom. If you want to purchase this, this um, you know, these particular products, you can click your OK yeah. and it'll take you, it'll take, you it'll take you to another area. And I have to think when it comes to targeting, you know, as far as um, um, it's an ad insertion, be able to address that particular member of the audience. I, I think there's some debate open on that. I think well, there's some pretty good success. Kaltura has a, a really strong capability when it comes to um, targeting the viewer and being able to um, allow that for that kind of engagement. Am I wrong? Uh, no, you're right. I think there's a lot of intersection of commerce and content. I think just like Amazon, right? We One of our clients is Flipkart in India. They're like the Walmart of India. So they've integrated alongside their commerce, a lot of video content. So people are, you know, kind of merging those experiences side by side, maybe not as overlays, right? But as a single hub uh, for their users. Um, Walmart obviously had their own streaming service. So you're seeing a lot of uh, um, synergies here between commerce and content. Um, I think to, to your point about targeting, I, I see the challenge, Anthony, of a, of a household, right? You, you need to understand the people are watching can be, you know, the parents, the children, and how do you differentiate between these users and user management is becoming um, a challenge to manage multiple users, even, you know, on your Netflix account, right? Who's watching that content in order to, to target them with addressable ads. I think connected TVs offer a lot in terms of like ACR and ability to, to target. So it's really coming together. I think we are reaching, you know, the tipping point um, in, in that sense of delivering really addressable ads on these platforms um, with, with all the data capture capabilities. Well, it just seems like it's, while I love my subscription services and the, the programming that's there, the quality of programming that's being brought to me from around the world, I think that's fantastic. But when it comes to fast to being able to, um, target advertising to me, which I always have been experiencing with Comcast over the last four years comfortably. It seems like it. it uh, you know, when I watch the news, it, not to say that I'm running next door to see what they're watching, it just happens to be it's pretty applicable to our, our way of life in our social economic area that we live in. Um, and so, as you say, it's just being, it's refining the kind of experience and being able to have a fast service that could accurately target products that I am interested in correctly in short forms, not the typical a and &E, you know, 12 average, you know, commercial break um, pause, um, you know, down to two or three, um, you know, that, that's, that's of interest to me and in being able to watch that. So viewing, viewing experience comes into play here too with fast being able to have short pods that allow for targeted information to me, I think we're going to see a lot more traction and uptick uh, when it comes to that viewing. Uh, John, you're you're ready to, to jump on that. Um, what do you what do you think? We, well, we we do have a study that we do every year on on ad supported TV content, 
and 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 one thing that uh, makes people feel like the ad experience is more tolerable or engaging is is a fewer ads um, but the biggest thing the it has more of a driver than anything else is seeing ads for a product that they're interested in and uh, when you ask people if they want to share their information with advertisers or with their tv company they say no but if you say well what if you could see ads that were more relevant to the things you're interested in they say yes so that's that's an experience that is good for the advertisers, it's good for the platform, and it's good for the consumers. It's a, it's a triple win. You know, you really come down, and just in the last point here, to just make a comment, it with with Renit in Kaltura and Anthony with Zumo, you guys would have really strong offerings that really have a bit, that can have a big impact on this industry. And we've we've settled on some very key points is rebundling is taking place. But the definition of rebundling isn't exactly what it used to be, which is quantity of programs or networks. It's down to selective programming that the viewer has interest in to be able to be bundled. It's combined with um, other business models and economic benefits as far as fast to be able to be targeted and engaged and having a back end that can facilitate some sort of potential commerce engagement. We're watching this take place right in front of us with the ability to rebundle the viewer's experience. And I wanted to thank each one of you, Ronit, Anthony, and John, and joining myself and Eric. Um, we're at that magic hour right there to be able to step into now um, a thanks to our audience. Um, and if there's any questions, please shoot them to Eric. Um, he'll get them to us, and we'll look forward to connecting and answering them um, when we receive them. So thank you, everyone. Alan McLennan, appreciate your time. Eric? Thank you so much, everyone, and I look forward to hopefully seeing all of you in person relatively soon. That wraps up Streaming Media East Connect 2021. We will be back tomorrow morning with the Content Delivery Summit. And once again, thanks to Signian. When the director calls action. And action. When the game is on. It's or it's time to save the universe again. Score. Media Shuttle is there. Trusted by more than 25,000 media companies, Media Shuttle delivers, making it easy and secure to send any size file anywhere fast. The journey begins with Media Shuttle portals, customized and branded for any project and designed to be so easy, your end users will love it. All while giving operations teams complete control through a simple yet powerful admin interface. Add users, set permissions, customize file delivery specs, and report on all activity. Blast off with proprietary acceleration technology. Media Shuttle moves your content anywhere in the internet connected world at hyper speeds. Along the way, your files are protected. Our commitment to enterprise grade security has made Media Shuttle a preferred tool with Hollywood studios, major sports leagues, broadcasters, and more. With Media Shuttle, your files are never handed over to Signet. File movement is orchestrated between the end user's workstation and your storage, whether on prem or in the cloud. Your IT team simply provisions your storage, connecting it to the Media Shuttle cloud service, and Signet handles the rest. Get started on your Media Shuttle journey today, a journey without limits.